What is going on? Welcome back to the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast. This show is all about the future of humanity, artificial intelligence, hermetic philosophy, and a lot of other crazy shit. My name is Paul Tokizolu. I'm here with my buddy, Scotty P. Scott Pelzel. What is up, brother? How are you today? I'm great, dude. Excited it's to good to have you, man. Today, we're going to dive deep into the Avatar, The Last Airbender. So before we get into this, Scott, I want to ask you, man, like, what do you love so much about The Avatar, The Last Airbender? I know you said it's one of your favorite shows. Like, what really draws you to this show? Oh, I think the concept is cool. You know, it's a, it's about an avatar who has, he's like specially chosen to be able to control all the elements. And uh, as you learn in the show, not everyone can control elements. And the ones that do, they can only control one element, whether it be fire, earth, air, or water. And it just really is a good portrayal of the hero's journey where this kid, he's trying to find his way. And he has to go through a process and discipline and training and so much is, is expected of him. And yeah, man, just for me, it kind of rang true. And I saw a lot of metaphors for life. Like it really does a great job of like teaching you about life. Man, I agree. Like it's such a great show. It's so beautiful. Um, what What sort of metaphors do you feel really stick out to you? Because I mean, I've got got a lot to say on this, but I want to hear from you, man. Like what, what metaphors specifically are your favorite in the show? Well, my favorite specifically, I'll go to one of the episodes. It's like towards the end of the show, he meets a lion turtle and it's like this gigantic mystical being. And apparently it only shows up at like, you know, when he needs it most and no one else saw it except the avatar. And it's like a floating Island with, like the island is on this turtle's back and he comes out of nowhere and he's got like a lion head and then his body's a turtle with an island. So if you can imagine how big that is. And he takes the avatar on a journey and is like answering his questions, kind of like a spiritual guide. And one of the things that he says is that before the time that they're in now, like he pretty much says a long time ago, the benders of the planet didn't just bend the elements they bent the energy within themselves and could control any aspect of the elements and man that is like so true with just like you know life today where it's like we're so focused on our outer surroundings that you know we all forget that you know true mastery comes from bending our own will so that that one was just one of my favorites yeah i, I love that man and i feel like that really is like the allegorical journey of the hero, like you said, of like finding the, the philosophical uh, golden fleece, you know, like Jason and the, and the Argonauts, they find the golden fleece. There's always something that the hero is looking to find and bring back to the tribe. And really that represents like, for me, it represents finding love within yourself and like activating the, the inner part of your life, you know, the, whatever you want to call it, the chakra system. But for me, it really is like the, the middle pillar of energy that's inside of all humans, like the, the energy source, so to speak. And I think that that's like what that metaphor speaks. That, like, that's what I always took from that metaphor is like, it's like referring to that, that like secret source of energy that we all have within ourselves as these divine beings of energy that we could call upon at any moment if we just knew how to kind of tap into it. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what magic is all about really is trying to access that. So I love it, man. For me, the, the avatar, it's, it's all about like just an allegory for the magical journey of like mastering the different elements. And, um, for me, that like represents the different emotions, the different or the different, not even emotions, but like almost like the different paths of life, uh, for me. I don't know. What do the different elements represent for you? I want to hear, hear your take on this. Yeah, well, I didn't really have know too much about exactly what the elements were a metaphor for, and you were kind of blowing my mind on it the other day. But I do want to say about the love thing, you know, so it's like just a little more clarification to people about, you know, what does it exactly mean to find, you know, to find love within yourself and tap into it as an energy source. Something that I've learned is that <clears throat> I used to think that the more I hated myself, the more I would suffer to become better. Because I would, 
you know, I just always had it in my mind that I wasn't worthy and I have to do these things because I have to prove myself. I have to suffer in order to be of worth or to be something special. And along my journey, I realized that if you love yourself, you'll be able to do so much more that the idea of hating yourself and forcing yourself to do these things because, you know, you don't like the way that you look or you don't like the way that you perform or you don't like what you're capable of, that that is a good, that is better than a lot of other energies, right? So at least it makes you angry to be able to do those things. But in comparison to loving yourself, it's like not even comparing because when you love yourself or as you learn to do it and you love yourself, you do those things because you just like you, you get like an excitement for it. It's like there's nothing else for you to do but to do it. And uh, that's something that I've come across in my martial arts journey is that, man, the more I find the love, the easier it is to do these things instead of like shaming myself into doing them. Man, that was beautiful. Uh, what you said. That's thanks for sharing that, man. Um, yeah. For me, like I used to struggle with self hate a lot and it just resulted in a lot of like self sabotage. Cause I think when you, um, when you hate yourself, you, you want yourself to fail secretly because you almost need to like prove that to yourself. Like if you actually ap achieve your goals, then, then like you suddenly have to approve of yourself. And if you have this like self hatred loop, it's really hard to manifest something where you're gonna approve of yourself. So for me, it was like, it was just so self-destructive. Like, yeah, it created a lot of like drive and stuff, but, um, I just never, it was just so unproductive, I guess. Like I just always end up sabotaging myself is what I found. And then I clicked for me. I was like, oh man, it's cause I secretly hate myself. Like if I hate myself, of course I want myself to fail because then it keeps me in the cycle of like, oh, I've got to achieve again. Cause I didn't make it that one time. And then I changed the story. I was like, man, no, I'm, I'm the guy where it works out the first time. Like I don't fail. It just works out. Like what if it just works out? And then I have to approve of myself. What then? And it's a lot more productive <laughs> and way more fun. Right, right. Way more so fun. tell me about the elements, man. You 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 told were telling me about how the the jur the journey through the elements was about the journey of magic. So that that rang true for me. So I couldn't figure it out before, but when you said that, it's just like a click went off in my head. So I'd like to hear well, about that. The, well, uh, I'm not the one who came up with this. So I, the reason I know such things is because I've read it in books and I actually have, <laughs> yeah. I have one of those books here with me. So if not for books like this one, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, which I've talked about on the show before many times, and I think I've shared with you, I think you've started reading this book. So I'm going to spoil part have. of the book for you. Um, do it. This is a little, I think uh, this is in uh, part two. Uh, so this is in the ritual, like the second half of the book, chapter four. And uh, I'm just going to read a little bit here. The chapter is called The Conjuration of the Four. Okay. The elementary spirits are like children. They most often torment those who deal with them, unless one can dominate them through high reason and with great severity. It is these spirits which we designate under the name of occult elements. It is they who often determine our disquieting or bizarre dreams for us. It is they who produce movements in the dousing wand and knocking sounds on walls or furniture, but they can never manifest another thought than their own. And if we think of nothing, they speak to us with all the incoherence of dreams. They indifferently reproduce good and evil because they have no free will and in consequence, no responsibility. They appear to ecstatics, ecstatics and so, uh, somnambulists, it's a big word, somnambulists, uh, <laughs> it's a big word. Never heard that word before this book, somnambulist, but I think it means like a person who's like kind of given in to the spirits or something like that. But anyway, mm. they appear to ecstatics and somnambulists in incomplete and fugitive forms. They are what caused the nightmares of St. Anthony and what most probably caused the visions of Swedenborg. They are neither damned nor guilty. They are curious and innocent. They can be used or abused like animals or children. The mage who employs their, co their cooperation takes upon himself a terrible responsibility because, because he must expiate all evil that he might have them do. And the grandeur of his torments will be proportionate to the extent of the power he will have exercised as their mediator. 
To dominate the spirits and thus become king of the occult elements, one must first submit to the four trials of the ancient initiations. And since these initiations no longer exist, one must have gone through anal uh, analogous, or I'm sorry, analogous ordeals, uh, such as exposing oneself without fear to fire, crossing over a chasm on a tree trunk or a plank, climbing a mountain peak during a storm, swimming out of a waterfall or out of a dangerous whirlpool. The man who is afraid of water will never be regenerated by the undines. He who fears fire will be unable to command the salamanders. As long as we feel vertigo, one must leave the sylphs in peace and not irritate the gnomes, because the inferior spirits only obey a power that has been proven and shown to be their master, even in their own element. One who acquires through boldness and practice this incontestable power, one must impose the verb of one's will upon the elements through special consecrations of air, of fire, of water, and of earth. And this is the indisputable commencement of all magical operations. The end. The end of that, what I'm going to read anyway. It keeps going and gets into all sorts of crazy stuff. But that's the... Uh, kind of introduction to that stuff. But yeah, basically what he gets into is this con this concept of how these different occult spirits or elements or whatever you want to call them are manifestations of our own uh, emotions or our own emotional states or like almost like what exists within ourselves. And um, so a salamander, for instance, although it could be a fire demon in quotation marks, what it really represents is some sort of a manifestation of something within yourself that could get out of control if you allow it and it could go on to destroy your entire life but uh it's almost like an allegorical demon you know all well all demons are kind of allegorical i guess is what i'm saying but that doesn't make it less powerful what is like in this book he warns again and again like this stuff is not for the faint of heart and for me that's what the avatar is all about it's like it's you know almost like a the someone who studied this stuff made a cartoon about it. It was like, hey, let's make a cartoon of someone going through all of this crazy stuff that in these magic books is talked about allegorically. And then we have the Avatar cartoon where he's actually going and conquering dragons and fighting, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. And um, I don't know, for me, I just, I just, I love it. I love the show. Um, it's almost like the creators are, are winking at anyone who knows about this stuff. Um, but yeah, it blows my mind too. Like when I found out about this, I was like, wait a second, that's crazy. Like not only is this nothing that I came up with or nothing new, but it's been written about for like for thousands of years. Um, it's written in the hermetic corpus too, which I have, uh, over here. I just can't find the specific part or I couldn't find the specific part, but yeah, they talk about it in the hermetic corpus too. All about, let me see um, that book, this stuff right here, the hermetic the corpus, the corpus hermeticum. Let me see if uh. I can find something to hear about it. But yeah, man, what do you think about uh, what I read? I mean, uh, does it sound like complete gibberish or craziness? Or I don't know. What's your initial take on that? Let me try to find something else in this book. Yeah. Um, well, I've been going through the book, and even what you're reading, it's like you really have to like break it down as of what he's saying. You know, there's like a lot going on, very complicated words. Like, uh, I try to listen to the book while I'm driving to training and yeah, I essentially have to like rethink about like every sentence that he says, uh, because it's intense. Yes. It's a deep book. Um, and, uh, I literally like, I was, I became like obsessed with it and I just, uh, was listening to it on audible every day for like a year or two. I still listen to it all the time, but, um, it really took that. It was like almost after six months um or so that I, before i started to really actually understand what he was actually writing about and a part of it is because in some of these books about magic they give you like the key to what is being discussed later in the book because they almost want you to read the whole thing before you're going to understand it if that makes sense um which is super weird super weird way to write a book but that's how a lot of these guys write <laughs> uh but yeah, I don't know if you found that before reading like Manly Hall, but he does the same thing, but to a lesser extent. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I but, also um, like the character development in Avatar, like Zuko. 
his whole arc was was really awesome. How first he's a bad guy and he eventually turns into a good guy and he essentially conquers his rage, right? Getting past um, pretty much his pride and uh, General Iroh breaks it down for him where it's like uh, his whole arc was, you know, he's like trying to prove himself to his dad and capture the Avatar and General Iroh tells him that you know humiliation comes from pride, so it you think that you're owed something or you think that you, something belongs to you, so this is why you're humiliated. But if you are humble, then it wouldn't matter. And you know, that's a big lesson to learn because all of us feel feel humiliation at some point in our lives. But you know the truth is is that there's never really anything to be humiliated about if you're humble. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's so true, man. And for me, like. I feel like Zuko is really the epitome of fire because that's really what the fire is all about. It's like the, the will or the drive to succeed and like make something of yourself. It's really like almost what we were talking about before, like the, the dynamic of love and hate that like fuels you to do something, whether it's like your love for jujitsu that pushes you to want to compete at a higher level or, or on the negative side, the like, self-hatred that might push you to go do something to get that approval that you've always wanted or whatever, you know, but it's like, that's the, that balance of fire of like the will or almost that the, the thing you're supposed to do. I think that's for me, like what fire means is the, the thing you're supposed to do, like passion, you know, what are you passionate about? What is your will supposed to accomplish here in the physical world? I don't know. What does fire mean to you, Scott? Like, what do you think about when you think of the element of fire or mastering fire in the the physical world? Uh, I guess the first thing off the top of my head is um, I just make this reference a lot, but I use it in terms of like, uh, <clears throat> like leg locks, you know, it's like the the term people use is, you know, you play with fire, you die by fire or you play, you play with fire, you get burnt or, you know, you win by the sword, you die by the sword. And it's just a reference to that. If you only study one thing to try and like use it to be a master is that that will also be your doom. And you see this a lot with leg locks where it's like someone is constantly trying to go for a leg lock because it's, they feel like it's super powerful and OP overpowered. And then what happens is, is they just get leg locked by a more complete grappler or they get their back taken. And so it's, you know, just that overall thing. And you see the same thing in basketball where uh, players that only want to shoot the three, it's like, you know, you live by the three, you die by the three. So it's like, you know, sometimes shooting threes is awesome and you get all the points and uh, you put your, you put yourself at such a lead that the other, your opponent can't keep up. But then sometimes you're just not making the threes and you lose because that, that's the only part of your game that you're willing to master. So uh, that's yeah. what it kind of signified for me. Yeah, man. I, I think we're on the same page here. It's like that, um, that thing that makes you so good, but could also be your undoing at the same time. Like if yeah, you were to yeah. let it get out of hand. And if you think about it, that really is fire from a tool perspective too. Like literally if you take fire as the, the physical, you know, the physical burning fire, like it's a great tool that you can use to clear a path in the woods. Like we're about, to, we're thinking about doing a controlled burn uh, pretty soon here to try to burn out some brush. You know, we're going to use fire to clear brush basically, um, which is super common out here in Missouri to do. But if you let it get out of control, it could burn down the whole forest, which obviously you don't want to do. So you have to take certain precautions or even just making a fire like a bonfire. You know, a bonfire could be a great way to, connect and have a great time with your family or your friends, or it could get out of control and it could burn the house down, you know? And again, you got to take certain precautions. So it's like that for me is like the epitome of fire is literally the fire. It's like, you have to, um, you know, it's essential. You need it for your survival, but you can't let it get out of control because it'll burn down everything if it does. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, man, I want to move on and talk about the other ones. Like, let's talk about water. Um, let's talk about water. Like, what do you think about uh, the characters in Avatar who represent water? Like, what do they, like the water tribe in Avatar, what do those characters um, bring up for you, I guess? Yeah, for me, it seemed like they were more in tune with themselves 
right? And uh, they obviously embodied water and sense of flow, like in their style of martial arts. So not only were they elements, but they also had a style to their martial art that they, they controlled the elements through martial arts. And each martial art had its own style. And in water, you could see it was um, really into flowing and more like rounded and, you know, uh, smooth. But I also noticed that they were also more closed off from the world. So even though they seem to be more in tune with like community and the inner being, they shut themselves out from the rest of the world. So they were like a really powerful nation in the avatar, but they were at the, like the North and South poles and they pretty much like shut themselves out, shut themselves out from the rest of the elements and chose not to participate in, in the world conflict. That's what I noticed. Yeah, it's like um you know they have to protect themselves almost. They weren't as uh weren't as aggressive as the fire. I mean, and that seems kind of uh and it's funny because on the one side in magic uh water is equated with the emotions and it's meant like the emotional journey that we all go through or like the inner journey. And if you think about it, again, it's kind of the same sort of idea of like emotions are super powerful, but um, if they get out of control, then it could have a big backlash or it could create some problems. But the tendency with the a person's emotions is usually to keep them a little bit more guarded, especially in the West, like especially in America. Like we are typically taught to keep our emotions a little bit more guarded. So it's almost like that was my impression of the water tribe, too, was like they were there to defend themselves and they had this great capability to defend themselves, especially if you watch Legend of Korra. I don't know if you've seen Legend of Korra, too, like the sequel to Avatar, but the water tribe does a lot more ass kicking in Legend of Korra, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But uh, but anyway, so they could ki they kick some butt and. Um, but yeah, but they're not naturally aggressive. Like that's not their nature. Their nature is to be more in tune with the spiritual side or to be more reflective or to be more peaceful, you know, really. And it's kind of like at the same time, like you said, they're withdrawn. They're not, uh, they're not like involved with the, the rest of the world. They're just trying to be more secluded. And I think that's the nature of emotions. So yeah, it's interesting how the, how the creator is kind of, I don't know. I don't know if that was intentional, but it seems like a pretty strong similarity <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I noticed to not to switch it from water, but I, I noticed something yeah. about the air tribe was that, so they were about like, you know, extreme discipline, right? Cause it was like a tribe of monks and they were isolated and really about like study and, discipline and um like doing without like without the uh what is it the different flavors of life i guess you'd say um but they were the best at creativity and that se seems to me to ring through it's like if you want to be creative you have to be disciplined in the work you don't you don't become you're not creative in a sense that like you can't just not know anything about a subject or about a topic or about a a uh, skill set and then just like be able to think of things. But if you're like extremely disciplined in, in whatever it is, like let's say jujitsu and you do all the work, then you become creative because you're a master of the fundamentals. And so right. it kind of like, uh, to me, it seemed like that's where, why Aang was so creative with the way that he used the airbending was because he was like super disciplined in his come up. I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense. No, it does. And it's interesting that you say that because uh, going back to all these magic books in magic, the air element is, is, uh, tied in with the intellect and like your ability to think through problems or logically solve things or come up with creative solutions. And, um, yeah, it's really interesting that you would say that because that's, um, yeah, that's the similarity. So again, I'm not sure if the creators of avatar like intentionally did this, but I saw that, that crossover too, that, it was almost like the air tribe and avatar is considered like the wisdom class or like the smarter group that figured out more creative solutions to problems. And, um, yeah, and magic air is tied with the intellect and, um, really your, your intellect, you know, your, your intelligence basically. And, um, or your mind, I guess is a different way of saying that, um, your mental states, but, uh, yeah, air is super airy. For, for lack of a better way to explain it. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, man, what does air mean to you? Like when you think of the air as a element or as a, like a part of life? For, I mean, I'm still learning how to even incorporate these elements in my life, but uh, what I got from it from the show was it kind of reminds me of the idea of like the war of art in a sense that, you know, it, the whole premise of that book was that you have to do the work and in order to do the work, you have to like do it every day. Like in order to get like access to the muse or to get, you know, you know, there's this idea that we aren't really creative, that uh, creativity like embodies us, if that makes sense. Like these ideas are actual things and they come to us, right? It's not that we're inventing them, that this idea already exists in the, in the, uh, what would you call it? Like on the plane of existence, right? It exists. And then when you do the work, it can embody you so that you have it. And one of the things they tries to say is that you got to pretty much like sit in front, like if you're a a comedic writer, you got to sit and you got to write every day. Or you, if you're a writer, you got to write every day. If you're, um, you know, if you're a jujitsu guy, then you got to do jujitsu every single day. If you want to get the ideas or the creativity. Yeah. And so that's what I saw from the air tribe in the show was that they are all about discipline, like the most disciplined tribe, if you think about it. And that's why yeah. they were able to be the you're most right. creative with the powers. <laughs> That's a great point. So there's the link, a link between discipline and intellectual capacity. For basically. sure. That's so true, man. And if you look at it, like look at Miyamoto Masashi, like he's a great example of what you're talking about. This greatest samurai of all time, who is also a master poet and a great painter. And, a, you know, he was into all these other artistic disciplines and he's very philosophical. Like he seems like a good representation of this. And if you think of his style, like his ability to fight like a hundred people at once, like he must have had to be very flowy, like the like the the air. Um, you know, like Bruce Lee said, you gotta be like the water. But um uh, I for me, Misashi reminds me of the air. I don't know why. That makes sense. But um yeah, man. And um I, I wanted to talk about the earth. Let's bring it home. Bring it home with the earth. But um, yeah, what did the Earth people remind you of, man? Like, what did they bring up for you while you were watching the Avatar? Hmm, they seemed a little more, like, simplistic in their approach. Like, I don't want to say, like, rigid, too, because they're, like, very, like, um, like, very structured in everything. Like, even the martial arts movements that they did is very, like, front, direct, powerful. Um, that's what it kind of gave to me as far as like the, their style, like almost like hard headed battering Ram strength. Um, but as far as like, man, I don't really know what to pull from like the other aspects, but that's what the martial art that they use seemed to me. Yeah. It's a very like stoic, stoic mindset right, right. sort of thing. There we go. And, um, yeah, in magic, they talk about how earth represents like uh, strength and kind of groundedness, if that makes sense. Like having a, a firm foundation in life, things like this, concepts like this. And um, for me, like when I was, uh, I kind of made an intention that I would go on the path of earth, like to start things off. When I first learned about all this stuff, the earth is the first one that I decided that I was going to to get into or to study. And for me at the time, I wasn't really training jujitsu very much. And, um, that was like the thing that really shifted for me mentally. Like when I made that intent was something inside of me just said, like, you got to get back to training jujitsu all the time. And that like really has for me been the foundation of everything. Like, so when I think of earth, I think of jujitsu, I think like the, the physical stuff, like getting to the gym every day, eating healthy, training martial arts, um, almost like the baseline stuff. Like that's what I think when I think the earth element or like just having your finances in order or um, your house per- repaired, you know, or your car fixed, like this kind of stuff. Like, are you, are you grounded in this reality or are you late on all your bills and you, you know, you're secretly don't have any car insurance and your car's break- broken, like that kind of stuff. Like this is the kind of stuff that for me, I had to fix. Cause that, that was me. Like, I was the guy who, you know, was late on bills and, you know, car needed fixed and what I was intending to it. Cause I was all 
I was all intellect. I was all up in my head, you know, and I was all air and I was all working on these big entrepreneur projects. And I had gotten away from the basics, like go to jujitsu, eat healthy food, you know, pay your bills on time, get your car repaired. Like, so for me, earth means like that kind of stuff and the foundation, you know, without that, you got nothing. Dang, that's cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, dude. And, um, yeah, I want to bring it back to, to what you said earlier about like the, uh, I mean, spoiler alert for avatar, but like at the end, when they find out that there's the, the secret is all of them. Like the secret is that there's this force inside of you where you can bend all of them. That for me, again, it's like, just so epitomizes magic because a life is levy talks about, um, the pentagram and how that's what the pentagram sign represents is the sign of spirit over the other four elements. And he gets into that later in the book, but basically how that's like the real secret in, in magic is that the, when you tap into spirit, um, that's what is at the heart of everything. So that's at the heart of the other four elements. So like when you understand that as the key, then the other four kind of fall into place and everything kind of begins to work out when you focus on spirit and talking about how basically what he gets into and what hermetic philosophy gets into in general is how spirit is like the fundamental nature of reality, how everything literally is spirit, like from a, it's all consciousness, it's all living. And, um, yeah, how, when you understand that, then it's kind of like the other four almost just fall right into place a lot, a lot easier because you're working at the source. And for me, that's the same as like, you know, just to take it back to jujitsu, like in jujitsu, they always talk about these principles. It's like, good pressure. You know, there's all these core principles that everyone's always talking about focusing on or in business. It's the same thing. It's these core principles that you're supposed to focus on and, uh, you know, or with health, it's like, everyone's always like, Oh, just focus on the principles of eating healthy and you'll be good. It's like, it's the same secret again and again and again. It's like, focus on that core thing. So Scott, I want to ask you like the greatest, biggest question of all time. Like for you, what is that thing inside that, that for you is like, I, I don't know that, that guiding force, I guess that thing that if you like focus on this, everything else is going to just fall in line. Is there anything like that for you? Man, that's, that's intense. That's a deep question. Let's see here. We don't, we don't go small questions on this show. We do <laughs> <the big> questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess for me, I would say that what answers those questions for me is like getting away from the things that I do to like, like if I want answers on the next step forward or what I need to focus on or what I should pull from something, it's like going out in nature and just sitting around a fire and, you know, either smoking a little bit of weed or eating a little bit of mushrooms and uh, just being out in nature is a big piece of it and taking a break from, you know, the grind. Because a lot of times I find that, you know, when you're just in it, when you're in the grind, when you're like doing your day to day, you can get lost from why you even started it and you can forget why you do things. And so a lot of times, like because you have a goal in mind, you'll do like whatever it takes to accomplish it. And you'll like when you take a step back, you'll realize that you're doing things to accomplish that goal that not aren't necessarily in line with your complete way of being. And a, an example of that will be like a lot of times when I go out in nature and I just like deload, I realize I drink too many energy drinks and the energy drinks help me accomplish the things that I want to do. Right. It's like a little bit of uh, it's like pleasure and kind of gives me a like wakes me up a little bit and it can help me grind towards the things that I, I want to do, such as train and work out and edit and create. But then if I keep doing it too much, cause I'm, I'm in my head, I'm like, Oh, I got to do this. I got to do this. I've got to do this. Next thing I know I'm drinking three, you know, and it, sometimes I have to go out and just like get away from it and be like, dude, what are you doing? You don't need three energy drinks. Like, stop it. You don't, you don't need the one a day that you do just, and, and it always recenters me of being like, like how you're saying, you know, it'll help me get back to eating right. It helps me uh, remember that, Hey, Jiu-jitsu isn't your whole life. It's one aspect of it. And don't forget about these other things that you want to incorporate. So the, for me, that's the best answer I have. It's a beautiful answer. And um, 
Yeah, it's it's uh that's right in alignment with what I feel too, man. Like I uh, I remember I had a ayahuasca ceremony once and that was like the big kind of takeaway that I had from it uh from that particular session was um was just like the need to move your body or just kind of to to do the visceral things that you're talking about, like just the importance of just taking a break and doing nothing. Um it was like in the ceremony, I got to a point where I'd kind of had some big epiphany about something personal. Like I had kind of overcome some big mental hurdle that I was there to have. And, um, and the ceremony had just started and I, you know, I was maybe like an hour in to like a all day experience. And I was talking to the ayahuasca spirit and I was like, you know, mother ayahuasca, like, thank you for this big lesson. I'm ready for the next one. Like, give it to me. What's <laughs> next? What's next? And she was like, that's it, Paul. She was like, there's nothing else. It's like, and I was like, what am I supposed to do then? She was like, go outside, maybe do some yoga, like go talk to your buddy, smoke some pot, like, you know, something like anything, <laughs> like just go have fun, <laughs> like play some music, you know, like literally anything. But for me, that was like, like super powerful was just like that epiphany. I was like, Oh shit. Like once you process the thing, like once you get over it, it's like, I'll just, or once you accomplish your work for the day, you know, a different way of putting it, like then just be done. Like there's, you don't have to like overachieve just for the sake of, because you know, you have some emotional holdup. So yeah, I, I think you and I are, are right in alignment on this man. Yeah. Um, can I say one thing about the uh, elements, too, in Avatar? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I really liked about it is, for me, I could compare the elements to martial arts. And General Iroh, who's one of the you know awesome characters in the show, he like guides Zuko. And he's, just, he's a bad guy, but not, if that makes sense. He's just trying to help mentor uh, Zuko. And one of the things that he says is that, you can learn something from all the elements and it'll help, you know, your fire bending, you know, it's that you want to be a complete bender. So he's like essentially a revolutionary in, in this idea that he wants to learn from the other elements, not like shame them or cause in the show, everyone thinks that their elements the best and they all try to double down, but he comes to the point of like that. He learns the other techniques of the arts, even though he can't bend water, even though he can't bend air, he still tries to learn from them. And I see that a lot in grappling in a sense that, you know, people can almost get caught up in the loyalty they have to the specific art that they do, whether it's jujitsu wrestling or judo and uh, a true, master is going to master is going to try to learn from all of them and combine them because we're not, you know, jujitsu artists, we're grapplers. And if you want to be a great grappler, you need to know some wrestling. You need to know some judo. You need to know some sumo. You need to know, uh, what's another one? Um, uh, catch wrestling. Like they all have their place into being a, into a complete art. And the best grapplers learn from everything. So that, that really struck home for me. And General Iroh was able to redirect lightning from a water technique. He learns from the water how to redirect energy. And he's able to, like, if he gets hit with a technique, he can, like, absorb it and shoot it out the other side or his, his other hand, which is pretty intense. Man, General Iroh is my favorite. Like, without yeah, any right. doubt, he's the best character. <laughs> for Dude. real. Something you said uh, reminded me of uh, my coach, Mike Morgan, at uh, at Glory MMA in uh, Mountain Grove, where I will be training at here pretty soon, a couple hours. But um, he tell he talks to he like drills this into us a lot that he doesn't want us to think about jujitsu, but he wants us to think about fighting. And he told us this. I just remember the other a few weeks ago, he was like, "Guys, we are not a jujitsu school anymore. It's like we are a fight school." that practices jujitsu. It's like weird. It's like, I want you guys to get this out of your head. He was like, there's no such thing as like, you know, the one way to do it. He's like, it's all just fighting. 
humans. Like there's just mil there's all these uh, different ways to fight that humans have figured out over the years. And there's certain things that work in fights and there's certain things that don't work quite as well. But he's like, let's, and he's big on just focusing on like the high percentage stuff. Like he's nothing, nothing fancy. It's like, if it works, we're going to, we're going to, if it works, like demonstrate it at a high level, like in the UFC or something like that, then we're going to practice it. But if it's, if it has it, like if there's not video footage of someone like Khabib using it at a high level, Mike's not interested. So like, he's just not going to even touch it. Like you can drill that crap on your own time. This is like what he tells <laughs> us. He's like, if you want to work on your, you know, crazy moves, he's like, you can stay late and work on that. But he's like, we're working on the high percentage fundamentals that work at, at the highest level with punching involved. Like, you know, if, if, it, if, if it exposes you to punches, Mike's probably not going to teach it because he's got that, <laughs> you know, that mentality. And a lot of our guys, they fight MMA. So you know, you got to have that mentality because he's training, he's teaching kind of for that crowd. Um, but I think a lot of jujitsu guys miss this. They get so wrapped up in the sport and they forget that there's the martial side of it, like the fighting. You don't want to just be so focused on your barambolos and your inverted game and this, that, the other thing that you forget that if you get into a street fight, you're probably not going to pull guard, you're probably going to want to get a takedown. You know, something they forget to work on the take the takedowns. You know, like yeah, if you're a bottom guard player, that's great. But you know, know everything. I think that's what you're saying. That's what that's what you were saying about General Iroh, and what I was saying right. about Sensei Mike. But yeah, if someone's not listening to if someone's not a jujitsu person and they're listening to this, first of all, you should start training jujitsu. Uh, second of all, you should go check out us our other platforms, Scotty P Breakdowns on YouTube. You got Jiu-Jitsu Breakdowns. I got Jiu-Jitsu is my outlet on YouTube and on Instagram. But uh, Scotty, I just wanted – I got to run here in a minute, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about related to Avatar or related to the magical elements? No, man. I think we hit it pretty – Pretty square on the head, man. I, I would recommend that if anyone is into watching animated shows that The Last Airbender is, is really good. There's a lot to pull from it. And it, they have a follow-on series with uh, Katara, and that one's cool. And uh, you really blew my mind. And it was like almost like synchronicity in a sense that, dude, like the other day my brother asked me what the elements were a metaphor for. Because I, I tell him all the time these shows are metaphors for life. And he like puts me on the spot. And I was like, dude, oh, man, I don't know. And then you asked me literally a day or two later, you're like, hey, what do you think about the Avatar? And I'm like, dude, I love that show. And you're like, well, it's a metaphor for the magic journey. And literally my brain was like, Phew. so, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It, uh, like I said, it blew my mind too. I'm definitely not the one who came up with such a, with such a theory or such a concept of, of this. But again, if you're listening to this and you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend you check out the book that I've recommended probably a dozen times now on the podcast, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic by Elifus Levy. Uh, we'll put a link down below in the show notes if you want to check it out. But Written in the 1800s, for me, it's probably, it is dense, like Scott was saying. The Audible version is super accessible. Um, well, I wouldn't say super, it's more accessible. It's definitely dense, no matter how you spin it. Uh, but thankfully, someone did put in the hard work to translate it from the original French. So at least we can read it. So that's what I always say. <laughs> at the least, we can read it. It is originally written in French in the 1800s. So, you know. <laughs> You got to kind of, you got to just get into it. And um, I love what Mitch Horowitz said about reading old books and books that are a little more complicated. He was like, here's how you read a book that is complicated. He's like, anytime you get to a part that you don't understand, just turn the page, just keep reading. He's like, does it matter? He's like, I don't understand how, a lot of the stuff either. in some of the old books, he's like, just keep reading, like just turn the page. And like, yeah, that it might eventually make sense on the second or third time through. You know, but it's like, what are you going to do? Someone, I, back when I was a Christian, this is like a super tangent. I'm sorry. But oh, no when worries. I was a Christian back in the day, I remember one time someone said that at church and it really like struck with me. He was like, people are always complaining about the Bible being complicated to study. He's like, it's a 5,000 year old book. Of course, it's going to be a little complicated. <laughs> it's like, of course. And it just, I don't know, stuck with me. But uh, yeah, anyway. There's my spiel on old books. But Scott, thanks for doing this with me, bro. This has been fun. Uh, 
Yeah, dude, I appreciate it. You know, let's say you, if you're a listener and you don't know anything about magic, or maybe you're like, magic, what are these weirdos talking about? I would just say that, you know, if you want to approach it from an open mind, one of the things that comes across in the Avatar is that General Iroh says, if you want to bend the world to your will, you must first bend yourself. And one of the first quotes in the book of the Eliphas Levy, and I've only gotten through like seven chapters, so I don't know much, but one of the first things he says is that magic is a psychological process and that you must first master the inner emotions and psychological processes that are going on in order for you to, to uh, manipulate the reality outside of you. And you can find that truth in essentially every art, whether it's Buddhism, uh, Islam, uh, Christianity. So it's like not just this weird, like hippie woo woo type of stuff. This is like learning how to master your inner self so that the outer world starts to reflect. Yes. You said it, man. You said it. You must have been paying attention when he was, <laughs> when the audible guy was talking. I was but, trying um, to. Dude, it's, um, and the way that magicians understand the world, we were talking about this on the episode with Drew previously. It's that like everything is mental, or everything is composed of consciousness. So when you understand that, then you're like, oh, so when he says magic is a psychological process, someone who believes in like a world of matter is like, oh, so what? You know, who cares? But the magician understands or believes that. Like, you know, the psychological process basically shapes reality somehow. And uh, because everything is mental, if that makes sense. So the psychological process is everything is kind of the, the theory. But that's something that a person, I think, just has to find for themselves. Someone might be listening to this and be like, oh, that's a load of crock. Well, personal development is for, like you said, it's for everyone. It can be found in everything. So it's really the same message either way, but... That's kind of the whole point of what these magicians are always writing about is like, yes, they're all the same. Like Elifus Levy says in the book, he says, we do not seek to, uh, he was like, we don't seek to get rid of Christianity. We seek to explain it and, uh, and enhance it or something. I forget the exact word he said, but anyway, man, this has been great. This has been a lot of fun. Hell yeah, Appreciated dude. talking, bro. All we'll right, Scotty P. Later. Breakdowns. Scotty P. Breakdowns, breaking it down. See you guys later.